The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey guys, it's Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at Ensemble and founder of financial advice company Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby I started from scratch a little bit over seven years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the Ensemble community to scale the business to become one of the better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators in Australia. And through this podcast, you can join me each Tuesday as I have the absolute privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'm going to selfishly be able to learn and continue my journey to improve every area of my advice business. Hopefully, you can learn a few things on that journey as well. Jump over to Ensemble.com and if you haven't already signed up to learn and share from others or simply download the app. This podcast is proudly brought to you by 360 Health, MetLife's award-winning end-to-end health program designed to help your clients defend against serious health conditions so they can live healthier for longer. MetLife's 360 Health provides quick, easy and discreet access to over 50,000 leading local and global specialists, including general practitioners, doctors, psychologists, specialists and mental health clinicians. Talk to a MetLife sales manager today to find out more about how you and your clients can access expert medical support and guidance from the comfort of your own home. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the Ensemble team and today I'm here with Dave Ray. Dave's a financial advisor at Eth Invest. He's also a certified responsible investment advisor and CFP, super passionate in the ethical and impact investing space. So keen to get the lay of the land and some practical tips on how you actually roll this out in a business. Dave, great to have you here, mate. Thanks, Ben. Really good to be joining you today. And I thought a good place to start is just the, your journey and, and how you've ended up where you are and doing what you're doing today. Yeah, good place to start. Um, I suppose uh, you know, if I go right back to um, my original interest in um, the whole world of uh, investment and finance, it, it came through school and being interested in um, economics, uh, good at maths. Um, I had a, a grandfather who uh, pretty early on uh, shared his, I guess, lifelong passion with with investing. Uh, so, you know, the, the the value in investing in shares was sort of instilled in my uh, uh, teenage years, I guess, um, uh, through my grandfather. Uh, and I and I sort of fell into economics uh, post school, where I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Uh, accounting sort of seemed like a good way to get a good understanding of the finances of, of business and um, I happened to be there myself in a, a cadetship at one of the big four accounting firms. Uh, I wouldn't say accounting uh, and audit in particular was something that t- ended up as a as a passion, but uh, it, uh, but it gave me a really good grounding, I think, in terms of uh, understanding you know, the, the background of what's going on in a, in a business, both from a, a financial sense, but also, I guess, when you really get into it, thinking about the planning for the future. Although where I found myself in audit was, and the reason that I didn't last a really long time there was I always felt like it was backwards uh, looking. You know, you come into a a company and uh, they've already done the accounts for the previous financial year and and you're just looking to make sure that they're uh, they're correct and they they haven't been hiding anything and um, everything's uh, everything's ticked off and accounted for. Uh, So... I felt like I wanted to do something that was going to uh, be a little more present, I guess, in terms of you know the the role. So I moved into um, uh, funds management for a period of time, starting in an accounting role, um, and then into a, an investment team. Um, but I sort of landed in a in a more of a quant based role and spent my days uh, looking at, at spreadsheets and. Uh, not to sort of deride too much the, the people who are passionate about that kind of thing, but I found that um, spending my days using VLOOKUPs and and those kind of things wasn't wasn't really for me uh, either. So while I was there, I started studying a, a grad dip in, in financial planning because I thought that uh, as I learned a little bit about it and, and got to meet some 
um, you know, a couple of mentors in the industry who, who really sort of explained what financial planning was. This is back in the early sort of 2000s. It sounded like something that resonated with me a lot more in terms of what I was looking for in that it was, you know, you're looking um, ahead and you're planning with clients and, and, and you're also dealing with people and you, you know, you're looking at um, problems or, or issues they might have or, or goals they might have and you're, and you're really sort of working with them to, <laughs> to, to come up with something together. Um, and so that was, uh, you know, back sort of 2003 was, was really the start of the, the financial planning journey then. And so you've been, you've been the advisor for almost 20 years now. Um, what have been some of the biggest changes in what you do as an advisor over that time? Yeah, look, there's been, there's been plenty, I, I guess, you know, it's probably a common reaction to say it's been a, a, a constant state of change really in financial advice in that in that time and if i think back to when i started that you know, the statement of advice was uh, was coming in um but it was pretty simple it was a pretty simple document um and certainly the compliance requirements around uh what you had to document in your files and 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 records of conversations with clients were were a lot less than they were today so you know but i think it goes without saying we've all seen the compliance requirements that have have come in and over time and i think they've you know, I've got no doubt that's that's been for the for the better. We've seen the, the benefit of what's happened um, as a as a profession um, by uh, in, increasing the requirements. You know, I, I think we can probably accept that they've gone um, a little bit bit too far in some respects, but um, they they definitely had to to move a long way from there. Um, I think we've oh, I've seen as well. That an evolution in um, in the investing piece too. So, you know, very much when I came, uh, became an advisor, um, active investing was was a big piece of, of what was going on. And I think for most advisors, active investing was the approach that they took um, throughout. I guess the GFC and um, and and the years following that. You know, there's been the growth of of active investment and then ETFs, um, and then more recently, I guess a uh, 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 big growth and, and level of interest in you know the ethical investing piece, um, and it's you know that that part's grown I think from uh, advisors who specialise in in ethical investing to really over the last probably five years or or so you know a lot more advisors are you know are starting to bring it into their existing business without necessarily it being the, the core focus of what they're doing. Uh, but, but starting to have those conversations with clients and yeah, that, that evolution that for me is probably, uh, that piece has been happening for the last seven or eight years. I'm now saying that as a, as a profession, more and more advisors, um, having those conversations with their clients too. Yeah, absolutely. And you probably know the stats uh, better than I do, but there's a huge amount of interest and volume going into the the ethical space. How has that? How did that journey start for you? Because I know that, like now, you work with Ethinvest, um, and you know, doing a lot of work in the ethical investing and impact investing space. Keen to unpack that in a bit more detail. But how did that? How did you get into that? Um, and, and you know, how did that progression sort of work for you? Yeah, really interesting question. So. It was probably seven, probably eight years ago now that uh, I was as an as an investor for uh, clients taking more of a an index or core satellite approach to things, uh, and th- and there were sort of three things that happened around the same uh, period of time that, that sort of piqued my interest and changed the way that I discussed it with with clients. So I had a, a couple of clients around the same time. Um, Actually, fill out their fact find question that you know. I, I admit in retrospect that I wasn't really good at explore, exploring with clients. We had one simple question that just said, "Do you have any environmental, social, uh, governance issues around the way you invest your money? Anything you'd rather not invest in?" And I didn't really explore that that properly with with clients. I um, at various times had probably uh, perpetuated the. Um, the the myth of uh, if you want to invest that way, you know, it'll um, probably cost you from a, an investment returns point of view. Um, 
but a couple of clients at the same time had actually just more of their own accord than uh, than through good questioning, I must admit, uh, came back and said, I'd rather avoid investing in a few particular areas. Uh, so that was one thing. Um, I also read an article about uh, in the Fin Review around, uh, it was titled something like the, the New Philanthropists, and it uh, included so the, the way that some, I guess, some younger um, people who had found their, their sort of family foundations were investing their capital and specifically around impact investment. And the, the comment that really struck a chord with me was that to invest in a way that's got an environmental or a social um, positive outcome to it doesn't necessarily mean you have to give up financial returns. So that made me think, well, you know, what, what does that mean? And uh, I started to do a bit of research on that and, you know, sort of happy to ex- explore that further um, if it if we go down that path. But the other one as well was, you know, like a lot of people, I was doing things like, you um, know, November and, and dry July and, and the like and raising money for cancer charities or other good purposes. Uh, but I sort of looked at my portfolio, my own personal portfolio, I went, hang on, my global equity portfolios to investing in tobacco companies, and these kind of things. So I'm kind of raising some uh, some money to try and help solve these problems or help people that are dealing with the outcomes. Uh, all of the bad things these companies are doing, but I'm still investing my money in there. So um, that, that sort of led me to uh, to thinking about my own personal portfolio as well. You know, so these things then you know, led me to go, well, particularly from the client perspective, if a couple of clients are saying, I don't want to invest in those things, well, ha- how am I going to deal with that? And at that point I hadn't. So, you know, it, it led me to looking at uh, trying to educate myself a little bit better, starting to look a bit more closely at uh, the APL to, that we had. You know, how can I deal with a portfolio that's going to cater to these uh, client preferences uh yeah so it was a you know that initial piece you know that eight eight years ago was really then uh starting to um understand how i could then put something in place for a client um and and yeah there was a big education piece there to make sure that i could um come to the the conversation with a client um with the knowledge that i was able to offer uh something for them um and not just sort of come up with a you know, a, a model or a piecemeal approach to it. One of the things that you mentioned there that is something that we hear a bit from clients is, as a pushback, and I suppose particularly in the current environment where we've got this massive resources boom and um, you know, resources and fossil fuel mining in particular is is a really common one I've found for our young clients that they are um, you know, more keen to, to avoid or when you talk to someone that is looking to avoid things in their investment portfolio, fossil fuels is one of the common things that comes up. We've got this resources boom happening at the moment where all of those companies are massively increasing in value. How do you deal with that sort of pushback or objection or conversation with clients uh, around, you know, the, the potential for them sacrificing returns or the situation where ethical portfolios are underperforming non-ethical portfolios like what we're experiencing at the moment? Yeah, look, it's certainly been, it's probably the most common question over the years and for the reasons you've just outlined, it's you know uh, even more common uh, now. So the way I've always positioned it with clients is, is is there is a lot of research around the Responsible Investment Association uh, amongst you know many others puts out research regularly to show that over the longer term you should be able to expect that a responsible or ethical portfolio should deliver returns at least in line with traditional portfolios, that you don't have to sacrifice returns uh, to invest in this way. Now, uh, anytime that you invest in a portfolio that varies from the benchmark, you're going to have short-term periods of time that you, know, you may underperform or alternative, you, alternatively, you may uh, outperform as well. And so you know, if you've had a um, portfolio that's more heavily weighted in technology, you know, you've probably seen something similar recently after years of outperformance. Um, so, but to address the, the fossil fuel question um, specifically, you know, I'll uh, always talk about it prior to, to giving clients advice that 
Um, you should expect in the short term that we will have periods of time where you'll underperform or, or outperform. Um, we put it in our statement of advice as well, so that it, you know we put it, you know, make sure that that risk is really clear to clients that that these kind of things will happen. And you know, in the last twelve months, you know, twenty twenty two in particular, it wasn't just uh, fossil fuels. The the technology piece was um, a factor as well because. Now, if we talk about investing ethically, um, a big part of that is is around sustainable technologies, and you know that might be energy or transport, agriculture, food, uh, alternative materials. So there is a bit of a technology bent. Um, also, you, you te- often will have a higher weight to healthcare. So there's not, some of those sectors weren't you know performing quite as well too. So yeah, look, there's no question it was a, a challenging year for um, for ethical investors it's a conversation where we're we're having with with clients in the main that accepting that yeah it, it is a year where where that's happened um but it's not something that we're seeing pushback on to say look you know i'm, I'm not happy i want to rebalance back towards a patch bar because i think the flip side of it too is that what we're seeing is uh, a lot of investment starting to go towards the alternatives to fossil fuels. So since the change in government in Australia, since the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, um, and uh, a lot of big investors around the world uh, are uh, accelerating their investment in um, alternatives to, to fossil fuels. So you know, we're saying that while there might be a short-term underperformance, that you know, we should uh, start to see a bit of tailwind in terms of the investment into the sectors that they should benefit from, you know, over this this coming decade. We've even got Twiggy Forest jumping on the bandwagon, and that's something uh, I wasn't ex- expecting to see. So I suppose it does highlight that that it is that the change is is it, it works. Yeah, with, with some colourful language recently too. <laughs> Dave, can you unpack for us the difference between ethical investing and impact investing? Yeah, look, it's one of the, uh, you know, I guess, first, you know, as, as financial advisors, we're uh, used to dealing with uh, acronyms and terms that can be confusing for clients. So, you know, this is a, a perfect example of that. So the, the Responsible Investment Association has a, has a really good sort of uh, spectrum, spectrum that they put together. They call it the Responsible Investing Spectrum. And I guess we, we often... We, some of the terms are used interchangeably. So whether it's responsible investing or ethical investing or sustainable investing, um, some of the key uh, areas of, of those different approaches um, are things like um, at a starting point, if you think about you know, traditional investments where you invest in everything, and I guess a good example of that is just investing in, in the index. You'll invest in every company potentially or most of the companies that are uh, uh, on the on the listed markets. If you then start going down the spectrum, um, ESG investing is really about taking your environmental, social and governance factors into account. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you change a portfolio, uh, but because you might look at a, 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 one fund manager might look at an ESG factor and say, okay, we're we're taking the risks of this company into an account. Into account, it could be, say, it's a tobacco company, as an example. Um, we we understand the risks that are there, but we'll still invest in that company once we understand that ESG risk. So ESG approaches can really vary uh, from you know not too much change into a portfolio in, in a portfolio to to being you know uh, a bit more. Uh, I guess, uh, active in excluding things from there, which sort of goes into the next piece around uh, an exclusionary uh, approach where a, a manager might focus on the companies that they want to avoid investing in. So start with a the full investment universe, but say we're not going to invest in things that are causing harm. So it might be alcohol, tobacco, gambling, um, fossil fuels, and that might be either a 100% exclusion on those sectors, or they may have a, a threshold um, uh, under which they'll uh, not uh, invest. And that could be, say, a 5% um, revenue threshold in those particular sectors. 
then you start to to move in, into sort of more positive uh, styles of investing, um, and, and it might be around positive screens or uh, sustainable themed investments. And that's where you're really looking at what are the companies that have um, a, a positive uh, aspect to what they're doing, things like healthcare, things like education, um, um, some that it might be aligned to um, particular frameworks. So they might be aligned to a positive UN framework in what they're doing. And, and then we get down to impact investing. And that's where you're really looking at companies that have at, at their sort of core uh, mission or purpose of what they're doing is a is an is an outcome um, that is um, aligned with uh, positive environmental law or social um, purpose. So typically, uh, you know, I'll explain that in um, in the way that a company um, is is trying to solve a really big problem. You know, one of the big problems that the world faces. You know, whether that's um, dirty energy or whether it's um, electric vehicles, it might be you know, plastics around um, an alternative material um, to plastics that use oils that can be um, um, put in the compost after its use. So the impact investment piece is sort of a few nuances around um, um, measuring what the impact of a portfolio is and that kind of thing. But in in essence, the starting point is is companies that have their, this, the sole reason for being is is um, a social or environmental um, purpose at their mission, as a, as opposed to that being a, a sort of a um, a secondary impact to what they're doing. Um, and one way of thinking about it is, if you look at a particular company, is thinking about what the company is is doing versus ca- how a company operates. And I often use Tesla as an example because if you think about what the company is doing, is if you think about you know electric vehicles, we know that the emissions reductions over time you know, will solve a, a big problem problem compared to um, internal combustion vehicles. Um, so what the company does is fits into sort of that impact um, thesis. But if you look at it from more of an ESG angle and go, well, how does that company operate? Well, yeah. clearly there's some issues around governance. Um, you know they're pretty well well documented um, and, and you could also argue around you know, the environmental piece as well in terms of the intensity of the materials that the company uh, uses. So um, I use a, in our business we use a framework which is the ABC framework to sort of, I, I like it as a simple takeaway for clients where if you think about a traditional portfolio, you know, it may or they, it does cause harm and then the ABC framework is a stands for avoid harm. B stands for you know benefit at stakeholders or, or benefits society, and C stands for contribute to solutions. So we align um, our investments, whether they're direct or ETFs or managed funds, within that framework to make it really easy for clients to align you know what they want to be investing in and what their values are with what their portfolio looks like. And we often find that once we do that. Clients will look at it and go, oh, "I can, I can see that, you know, this percentage of my portfolio is in avoiding harm, but now I really want to be sort of working towards these, these solution-based companies, so I can see that I don't have as much in there as that I'd like. How can we start to shift a bit more down to that end? And um, practically, how do you work that into conversations with clients? Because I know that that's something that we found as a challenge uh, with that, and I'm, I know that the power of a good question is there. You know, what does it look like along the client journey and how do you, you get there practically? Yeah, so I'll introduce it at, at every uh, first client meeting. And one of the things that I found is I I guess moved from the period of time where I wasn't doing that to starting to talk about it. Early on, I was probably selective with the clients that I talked to about it um, as I was getting comfortable with having the conversation and raising it. And, and, and it was you know, a, probably a bit of a judgment call to think, you know, which clients do I think might be interested in this? Whereas now I will talk to every client about it because one of the things that I, I started to find was that as I became more comfortable with the conversation and, and raising it, some of the clients that I might have thought weren't going to be as interested 
uh, sometimes we're the ones who it, it was really of interest to. Uh, so the sort of things that I do in that first meeting is 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 talk about uh, topical issues. Um, if I'm using a presentation with them, I'll have a slide where it's a real easy conversation starter. It's just a few pictures around um, the rooftop solar, you know, an electric vehicle, um, a big pile of, of um, plastic bottles, a, a picture of uh, a Patagonia ad which says, um, uh, you know, is, is around their sort of their re- reusing and, and repairing sort of model. It says, don't, don't buy me. You know, which is interesting for a fashion company to say that, and and so I find that in using that slide, you know, most clients will sort of identify with at least one of the issues in in, in that slide because it's something that they've been thinking about themselves. Um, you know, they've either they've got rooftop solar, and it might be well, you know, why did you do that? You know, was it was it just because it, it was the you know the cost calculation that you did versus you know your energy uh, bills. Um, or you know, looking at the electric vehicle, or they're, they're thinking about buying an EV, um, they're thinking about buying a hybrid. And why were you doing that? What was the interest? So that that sort of un- uncovers whether it, whether there's a values sort of component to it, as opposed to just a, a sort of a a pure cost benefit analysis on a on a consumer purchase. Um, and you know, there's things that are happening you know around us on a on a regular basis this you know i'm based in canberra but not that you know i think we're generally pretty sort of separate to what's going on politically even though we're in canberra but there's things that are happening in terms of policy are a bit more prominent now around uh things like you know carbon offsets or or in you know we've got in the act government is going through a, a periodic uh, phase out of uh, single-use plastics. So, you know, these are the sorts of topics that, that come up with clients. The the one that pro- prompted the biggest change, I think, in a number of clients at one time in recent years was post the bushfires. So, you know, I had a number of clients that I was talking to about fossil fuel investing who said, no, nah, look, I don't want to invest in in uh, gambling companies. You know, human rights issues are important, some of those things. But fossil fuels, I'm sort of still on the... Um, on the on on the sideline or sort of on, on the line on that, um, when uh, the bushfires happened at the end of sort of twenty nineteen, um, set out a communication to clients uh, around that, and you know, like a lot of the country, we had you know um, weeks and weeks of seriously impacted um, health issues in in Canberra, where we're just blanketed with smoke. A lot of people in Canberra have places down the southern uh, down the south coast and. Um, areas that were yeah, really badly affected by the fires too. Um, when I set the communication out, I had four clients who came back immediately and said, "Look, I know you've talked about fossil fuel investing um, before. Said, you know, we didn't want to um, a- avoid that, but look, now we want to look at that again and have another conversation around that." And they since you know divested from fossil fuels. So I think sometimes it's it, it's important from um, the point of view of getting that personal connection, and and most clients have it. Some some will say, look, you know, there's nothing I don't really care. I just want to get the best return, um, and that's fine. You know, we I'm, I'm not in a position to say um, I, this is what you should be doing as a client. It's just uncovering their their preferences. And I should add to that as well that you know, even in our in our business, that you know, is if is named as invest, and you know, it's a core. Um, a very core cool part of what we do. Um, you know, we don't. Um, the clients that I work with aren't saying, "Look, I'm prepared to give up returns." So it's really an important conversation now um, uh, around that with them to um, make sure that we're still getting good returns for them. It's not about um, sacrificing that. Um, you know, there can be some where you're in a, a if you're dealing with a charitable organisation or, or other high net worths, but. Um, in the majority of cases, the vast majority, it's, it's still financial returns alongside uh, um, the, the ethical investing as well. Totally, and there's more and more research coming out, as which you touched on, saying or showing that that it doesn't actually have a measurable impact over over the longer term, and um, it's it's just cyclical. And I think that that's where some you know anti-ethical investors can point to. 
but I think that's true of any sort of uh, you know class of investments or or investment sector as well. Dave, um, what's what's coming up for you in this space uh, moving forward from here? Yeah, look, I think we one of the interesting things I've seen with uh, both clients and advisors that I talk to uh, actually um, is that sort of you know spectrum that I touched on where uh, a, a lot of uh, the starting point is excluding things and, and just getting out of the most harmful sectors and and then sort of moving down a bit of an evolution I guess as as clients um, are, was as I educate them over the years and they get to understand this uh, better you know they, they might be a bit more engaged in politics or they start to read a bit more about you know ethical investing I see that they start to move down towards more sustainable and impact in investing and I think that's um, something that, you know, in talking to other advisors, I see as well. Um, it's certainly an area that, that I think, if you think about the, you know, the, the startup investing world, um, one of the interesting phenomenons that's happened in recent years is that, you know, some of the, you know, the, the, the brightest minds in startup world were, were going to places like Facebook and, and our Instagram and, and TikTok and wherever, you know, thinking about it at a global sense, you know, 10 years ago or whatever it was, but, we're starting to see a, a lot of you know the really you know, the brightest minds sort of um, moving into to companies that are trying to solve these big problems. So they're going into you know climate technology, or they're going into you know biotechnology, or alternative food, um, all all these sorts of things. So that's really exciting. And I think from um, an advisor point of view, um, you know one of the things we do at Eth Invest that I know not. Uh, all advisors have access to, but there's really interesting stuff happening in the wholesale investing space. So in in venture capital, in private equity, in in green property and green infrastructure around you know, un, unlisted markets uh, around uh, all of these areas, particularly around the, in the climate space. Um, but what I'm really hopeful that we'll start to see, and it's been talked about for a few years, is this term of democratizing impact. So. Um, bringing these really interesting solutions that are in the unlisted space in, into the the retail space for for clients, and I, I think that's what we're just starting to see now. But I'd love to see see more of it. I know there's a couple of companies that are are working in there. So um, I guess if if I can, you didn't ask for a call out, but if I can ask for a call out, you know, talk to advisors who are interested. Talk to the the fund managers you use and. You know, if, if this is something of interest and, um, you know, there's such uh, fascinating companies that are working in this space that, uh, you know, whether it's something like, um, you know, who, who gives a crap toilet paper that are in startup world, you know, they're in a venture, venture capital fund, um, or it's a climate technology business that, you know, there's interesting ones that um, a solar business in, in Wollongong that uh, called SunDrive that has got some venture capital backing that, has got the most efficient solar panel in the world. You know these kind of things that are you know happening in Australia that are in the venture capital space that only the unlisted investors can get into. Um, but I'd love to see those opportunities you know come up in um, either a listed investment company or however they become available for for retail investors to use. Because I, I think that's what we'll start to see is our, our clients are already you know, doing that. But I think. More broadly, advisors are going to be looking for these kind of opportunities down the track. So, yeah, I'm really excited with, I guess, more capital coming into ethical investing, but then pushing more towards the uh, the solutions end of the spectrum. Absolutely, yeah. It's, I think it's it's super interesting in the underlying companies, but I think if also if you look at the progression, just in the way that investors can access these solutions over the last peak five years. Uh, the progression has been huge, and and no doubt that will continue. Uh, you know, as it becomes more and more front of mind for for our clients and and for the general investing public as well. So, uh, yeah, de- definitely a, a space that we can't ignore and and one to watch moving forward. But Dave, thank you so much for sharing your insights, mate. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, great, great to see the goals that you guys are kicking. It was really good doing, uh, to join you on here. I love the work that you're doing with the podcast and 
hearing from other advisors and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to share my story, Ben. Oh, mate, stop it. You're making me bluff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cheers, Dave. And thank you, team. We'll catch you on the next one. 